sound now. Now we have sound. Okay. Three. We'll go back. I'm, I'm going to recap a little bit just for the benefit of people that are viewing online. So this is the Go, Bro Go Proverbs JavaScript edition. So we're taking the Rob Pike's Proverbs in Go and we're adapting them to Node. So now they're, today they are the Node Proverbs. Uh, the presentation is at this link if you'd like to follow along. That is beyondcodebootcamp.github.io slash preso slash go proverbs for js. That last part hyphenated. And then I am AJ O'Neill. I'm at underscore beyond code on Twitter if you want to follow the good stuff. Or at coolage86 if you want to have all the politic nonsense, which you probably don't. And then twitch.tv slash coolage86 for the live streams. I'm a dangerous wrong thinker, equal opportunity offender, and technophobic technologist extraordinaire. So this is part of the Creeds of Craftsmanship series, which are the most important archaeological finds of the 22nd century. Also, uh, just in, these are software engineering principles and talks and et cetera that I'm, that I'm going over as part of the series. We did Zen of Python last time. We're doing Go Proverbs now. We'll do more in the future. And this is the actual talk that you should walk, uh, watch. Uh, that is from Rob Pike, the one that came up with the Go Proverbs. So that's, that talk is linked at creedsofcraftsmanship.com or right here, the, the YouTube video. And then uh, I'm just going to gloss over this one since I just did it while the audio wasn't on. Don't communicate by sharing memory. Share memory by communicating. This is the first of the Go Proverbs. Oh, and there was the nice poster here that I, that I was showing earlier. Go Proverbs poster. If you search for that, you can find it. And it's got all 19 of them, and it's nice formatted desk size, so you can print it out, frame it, and put it on your desk. That's what I do. And then nitpick and code reviews and say, this violates G12. I don't remember what G12 is. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's go with uh, clear, is, uh, clear is better than clever. That's a good one to go with. Okay. There, 13. There we go, 13. That's the one I want to do. Okay. Anyway, so in, in, in essence, what this means is you don't want to... You don't want to set stuff in variables and then be checking variables period periodically to communicate something in your program. Instead, you want to be using either promises or events, and uh, you probably shouldn't be using callbacks because you should be using promises or events. And I'll repeat some of the other stuff that I said uh, later. So number two, principle number two is concurrency is not parallelism. Does anybody know the difference between concurrency and parallelism? I know it's uh, sort of concurrency is having different things in process at the same time. Parallelism, well, I guess uh, you can have multiple things going on, but parallelism is actually doing them literally at the same time. Is that, did I get that right, or am I backwards, or am I totally wrong? Eh. <laughs> well, well it's, okay. sometimes it's it's better just to show the examples rather than ask the question. But I thought anyway. Concurrency is what you normally are doing in Node. And Node doesn't have different semantics for concurrency versus parallelism, or at least not ones that are well documented and well understood. There are certain patterns that, that apply. But this is concurrency, okay? If you've used Express, hopefully everybody here has used Express. Yes, I have. Good. Uh, yeah, all right. So you've done app.get. And what you'll notice, if, you, if you'd ever served a large file, in Node versus serving a large file in Python, what you'd notice is that if you just use the default uh, web server with Python, if if you're downloading a gigabyte file, no one else can can access that resource while you're downloading it. It can only do one at a time, and so you have to spin up multiple processes if you want multiple things to be able to happen. And this is how PHP works, and this is how Python works, and this is how Ruby works. All of them take up lots of memory and uh, end up being really slow, and this is the great advantage of Node that Node brought in around 2010 when it came out, or I guess it was a little earlier than that, 2008, is that Node is concurrent by default. You don't have to do anything special. It uses the native features of JavaScript to be able to handle multiple requests at the same time, and while any one request is blocking because your server is going to send data faster than the browser on the other side can receive data, while any of the network traffic is waiting, in the background, Node is just going to switch over to something else. So these, these are for operations that are event-based operations. Because in fact, with Node, anytime that you're actively doing something, if you run a while true loop, then you're going to block the, the main thread in the same way that you would block it in any other language. Uh, 
worse than what it would be in Go or languages that actually have, actually have um, developer facing concurrency. Because in, in Node, all the concurrency just, you get it for free, it's in the background. But Express, the way that Express works, that's concurrent. Many different things can be going on at the same time and they're different things. And we can, we'll talk more later about structure and whatnot. But parallelism is more when you are doing some sort of batch job or some sort of partitioned job. So say that you have a bucket of photos, a bunch of users of uploaded photos and, and you've got a new codec that came out uh, and Google just released VP10 and so now you're gonna re-encode all of your images with WebP with VP10 or some, some nonsense like that or Apple comes out with H267 and now you need to re-encode all of your videos. So those are the kind of things that you'd wanna do in batch or in parallel and some of this is actually what Lambda functions, or not Lambda functions as in the real Lambda functions, but what Amazon and Azure and places like that call Lambda functions are good at is when you need to do exactly the same thing and you want to do it fairly click quickly and you want to do a lot of it. So parallelism, you need to actually have multiple CPUs in order to have parallelism, whereas concurrency, typically you're running Node on a single CPU when you're, when you're putting it on a server and you might have multiple servers that are being load balanced, but Node itself only runs on a single CPU. Uh, well, there are some ways it can take advantage of multiple CPUs, but we'll not get into that here. Whereas um, some, something that's in, in parallel, if we were to do this batch job on resizing, we'd actually want probably to shell out to a program that can do the resizing, and if we had eight cores, we'd want literally eight of these tasks to be running at a time. Likewise, when you look at, there's certain algorithms one of them is, I don't remember the name of it, but it's, it's this famous fractal, but you can compute any quadrant of the fractal just by giving coordinates. And so you don't, you don't have to draw the first part of the fractal to draw, draw the last part of, well, last, to, to draw a later part of the fractal. If you're, given, if you're given any particular coordinates, you can just start drawing there. And so you could have, each CPU could be could be running part of the process in parallel, and then when it's all done, you bring it back together. So concurrency is more about the ebb and flow of different things happening, whereas parallelism is about the same thing happening all at once in order to complete a specific job faster. Typically speaking, I mean, you can stretch these words to mean different things. So any questions about that in the, these two examples here? So our express example, that demonstrates concurrency. Our batch example, this, that uh, demonstrates parallelism. Okay, so number three, channels orchestrate mutexes serialize. Yeah, because we have those in JavaScript. Wait, no we don't. So promises and events orchestrate await serializes. So I'm going to say more of the same here, but just giving kind of a tighter context around what this means. So when we think of orchestration, Orchestration, again, is more about concurrency, where we're looking at doing multiple different things at the same time. And so I'll give you a real world example of this, is if you wanted to make some stuff, you, you wanna bake a cake in the kitchen. Well, you could, you, you need a bunch of ingredients to be able to bake, you need some stuff set out on the table to be able to serve it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different processes that aren't really related to one another, and they can kind of go on at any time but we do want to get a, a, a basic understanding of when the thing is done in total and can move on to a different pipeline of the process. But there's a, you know, if I, if I get out the dishes, I can do that at the same time that I'm grabbing the milk. I could have one hand in the cabinet and one hand in the fridge. You know, they're, they're, not, it's, they're necessary for the full complete process, but they're individually not important. Likewise, uh, I could either get real milk or soy milk uh, depending on how I want to make my cake, I could either use eggs or applesauce. So if I'm, if I'm out of uh, milk, but I've got some soy milk, then I, I, could, I could either go to the store and get milk, or I could reach for the soy milk, whichever's faster. So the soy milk is going to win out on that one. You know, same thing with if I don't have eggs, I, could, I can use applesauce and, or mayonnaise, and uh, my, my cake will actually still turn out all right. It, this is true. Mayonnaise. All I'm hearing is don't eat cake that AJ made. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I've, I've had cake that's made with applesauce and cake that's made with mayonnaise. You and just said mayonnaise, so that doesn't sound right. 
but mayonnaise is mostly eggs. So anyway, but the point being, this is something that you, you could actually do in JavaScript and it's just about, it's about orchestrating different things. And this isn't a great example of orchestration because orchestration means a little bit more. This is more just another example of concurrency, but this is a good example of serialization or what in the JavaScript world we'll often call chaining. So these are three promises that are being chained. So we have a mix promise and then a bake promise and then a serve promise and then we're just chaining them. So we've got mix dot then bake dot then serve is essentially what this amounts to. And these actually do have to happen in this order. We cannot bake until we have mixed. We cannot serve until we have baked. So we cannot do these tasks concurrently. We must do these tasks serially. And so uh, it's just having the mental model of being aware, especially in JavaScript, this is tricky because like I said, we don't have the variety of primitives that you do in other languages like Go and Rust for dealing with these two different concepts. And so just kind of seeing these examples hopefully is illustrative of uh, being able to, to think about when, when is the order important and when, it is it, when is it not. And this is, this is important for performance, uh, not just for the, the particular, one particular request. You have to remember there's, there's a single request that you're handling if you're using Express right now. But then there's all the other requests that might be happening simultaneously. And it's good to have that in your head because I see a lot of times people just want to try to get things done as quickly as possible. They just want to throw a promise at all at everything. And if you've got a lot of events that are happening, you don't really want 160 things going on at one time. You're getting concurrency by virtue of the fact that, if I can go back here, uh, by virtue of the fact that you're using Express and each each request is concurrent, you're getting, you're already getting the benefit there. If you then try to parallelize and make lots and lots of things happen at the same time, you may just end up thrashing your CPU or thrashing the disk or thrashing the network or um, something like that. Anyway, so moving on. Oh, any other, any questions there or thoughts? Okay, so number four, and this is a really key one that goes, you know, any language, no matter whether you're doing something that requires concurrency or not, this is just super, super, super. A lot of these, these Go principles are really relevant to JavaScript because Go and JavaScript are so similar in their design and their intent. But this is something that is just really relevant to any programming language. The bigger the interface, the weaker the abstraction. So there, John Ousterhaus had a talk I, th I hope I got his last name right, but he had a talk at the Google Tech Talks recently within the last couple of years, and he talked about the idea of having narrow, narrow interfaces that are very deep as opposed to having shallow interfaces that are very wide. So I'm going to give you um, a, a sense of this. So here's, here's a narrow interface that, um, well, in this particular case, doesn't have a lot of depth to it, but it's illustrative. So we have a database engine that we need for some framework that we're going to use. It, it requires that we pass in a database. But the nice thing about this interface, the interface that we're fulfilling is, is the, the whole, the sum total of the function signatures that we need here. So all we need is a function that has a get and then can take a key and will return a string and a function that has a, and, and a, the object needs to have a get that's a function and a set that's a function that needs to be able to take a key and a string and then return an error if something went wrong. So this is a very simple to explain interface. It's incredibly valuable. There are so many applications when you just need to get and set and that's all you need to do. Uh, so it's, it's a very simple and small interface that is very clear as to what it does, I hope and very easy to understand. It could be useful in one application, could be useful in another application, is not difficult to develop it. If I had to create a plugin for whatever framework this is, a database plugin, no matter which database I'm using, for my preferred storage mechanism, this is pretty easy to do. So any question about this code here? Okay. Now here's a, a bigger interface. For contrast. Now this is requiring 
that a lot of stuff gets done, it's putting a lot of burden on the developer. So, and, and, it, and it's, it's, not very, it's not very much of an abstraction because it, this is basically the only database that could fulfill this engine would be a SQL uh, database. There's no, I could not use Mongo and fulfill this, or I could, but I'd just be putting some no ops in there. I couldn't use a file system to fulfill this because there's a get, there's a set, there's an index, which ostensibly I'd want to take some information and tell it to make it be able to read faster. There's a remove, which isn't, uh, which, you know, is pretty common and maybe we could have had that in the, the prior one, but a lot of times just setting something to nothing is the same as removing it, so you don't necessarily need to remove. Then we've got a find by, and we're going to have, you know, probably some query parameters we could pass in there, and then heaven forbid if we have to be able to sort greater than or less than or do dates or something like that. Um, and then we got to create cursor because this database engine is going to support paging and so when you get your result set you're going to have a cursor at which result set you're at and then you're going to be able to iterate down and it's got to create transaction. So these are all great things for a database to have but we've gone from having a small interface that's really useful, really simple to understand, really easy for people to program to, to something that's exposing a lot of internal to implementation details that really don't matter. If I wanted my Git function to be able to work by email address and phone number, I could just look at it, see if it has an at sign, and say, okay, I'm gonna try to use this as an email address, right? And likewise, I, I could see if it just looks like it's numbers, I could say, okay, well, this looks like a phone number. And I could, I could abstract away some of that functionality of what my find by is going to do if the use case of this database engine is fairly constrained. Um, you know, likewise with the other stuff. So that's, that's just the general idea, idea there is that the smaller, the, the bigger the interface is, the weaker the abstraction is, the more overhead you have in, in knowing. And it's important to get the, this right. We want narrow interfaces that are deep. We do not want shallow interfaces that are wide. So the, in this case, this one is rather shallow. But, oh, oops, I forgot to do my safe join down there. Uh, but that's just for illustrative purposes. So any questions on that? I think this is a common uh, anti-pattern I see with newer developers as they learn about abstraction and they're like, oh, I should abstract my database. And I've seen a number of cases where I've seen an abstraction that is a thin, thin layer over the actual database engine and you couldn't possibly replace the database engine. So like we've got a data access layer in our legacy code here that uh, takes Mongo query strings, uses Mongo operators. You're not putting a SQL database in there and writing a Mongo to SQL translation, translation layer to try to pretend it's you know, really a Mongo database. Yeah. If, it was, if it just had gets and sets, you could put anything in there, flat files, you know, any database. Yeah, and oh, that, time. and this is one of my arguments against ORMs. I, I think ORMs, object relational mappers for databases, became popular because of open source projects where people that knew what they were doing were using Postgres, but all the plebs were using MySQL. And then the plebs were like, I want to use your tool, but I can't figure out how to install Postgres. And my mom told me to use MySQL. And so then people said, oh, well, we need something that will work with both Postgres and MySQL. And that person... It would have been better for history if they'd just been shot right then and there. <laughs> hey, I'm just impressed their mom knows what my sequel is. Yep. Yeah, my grandma does, so. Mm. My grandma. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the point that I'm making is that we often abst abstract things that don't, that either they're bad abstractions because they're, 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 the interface is too big, or they're really weak abstractions and that they don't help us uh, accomplish anything for the real world use case because you're not really going to change your database. Okay, so number five, make the zero value useful. Now this doesn't work the same way in JavaScript because in Go, if you initialize uh, a number, it is set to zero at the start. Uh, but I'll give a couple of examples that are similar in JavaScript. So. Here, uh, you, people have a fetish with const. They want to use const for things that are obviously variables. I've talked about this numerous times, uh, both on the live streams and here uh, in presentations. So if you have to use a ternary expression, just realize you, are, you, you don't have a constant, you have a variable. You have something that literally is changing based on uh, inputs of the program. And this is really hard to read and it's just, 
it, there's you don't get a lot of value out of something like this, right? Um, so, and what people are trying to do is they're trying to avoid having a zero value for foo because once you set foo, you can't unset it. And we have to do const because because our Lord and Savior const is gonna. I, I don't know, <laughs> but because in terms of the compiler, this is it, the, the this, you, it's. It's not const. It's, not, it's just, more of an issue if you're on a team that like has their coding standards and like yeah. you're supposed to use const and that and stuff. And the linter forces you and it won't, it won't commit my code if I don't change it. And I'm just like, okay. Well, the, the linter rule needs to change because that somebody who doesn't understand good software engineering principles thought they were being cool or hip or whatever and put something in there. But this... This is making the zero value useful, or, or the default value, right? So if we do let foo equals bar, right? sorry for the contrived example, but I hope that this one is simple enough to understand. If we do let foo equals bar, we know that by default, foo is bar unless we change it. But if there's a has baz, then foo is gonna be equal to baz. This is really simple to read. Uh, in, in practice, Unless you're doing something really weird, there's not going to be any performance difference because when the program is set, it's going to have the constant bar and the constant baz are both going to be allocated in memory. And the only thing that's going to happen here is that foo will have, when this function gets put on the stack, foo is going to be put as part of that stack already pre-allocated to bar as opposed to being allocated to nothing. And assuming that bar is what foo is normally going to be, then that's a good default value because the next step will probably not happen. It won't usually have a has baz. And so therefore the pointer won't be reassigned. And so then you, you, your program is going to be just as optimal as it would in any other case. And then in the case where we have uh, a has baz, then, I mean, I think I, I can't say for sure because the way the JIT works in JavaScript is different every time there's a new release, but the compiler's gonna have to do more work here because it's gonna have to allocate foo. It won't actually know what to set it to in the happy path. So no matter what the outcome is, it's gonna have to have an extra step of then assigning the pointer. Whereas if, when it puts the function on the stack, if the pointer's already in the right place, and again, this is low level stuff that a lot of us don't worry about that often. But I, I, I like to throw the performance things out there because people think that performance is really cool and really hip. And if you can say that some sort of micro optimization is faster, then people will do it for just the stupid reason that it's faster. Realistically, neither of these is going to be faster, but you know, for any use case that you actually have. But I'm, I'm just providing some food out there. So you know, if you if you're in a fight with somebody who doesn't want to. You know, they, they don't like things that are readable. They probably like things that are fast. <laughs> so you say it's faster. So um, should I not be setting has baz inside a wall loop inside a set interval? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, 5B. <laughs> but we have, we, have, we have two problems in JavaScript. We have the default value or the, the zero value, but we also have the unexpected value. And so I'm also going to append to this, make the unexpected value useful. And what that means is... Here's something that's dangerous to do because JavaScript. So if I'm, I might be thinking in English rather than thinking in JavaScript, and I think, oh, I need to check if the token's expired. So I'm going to create a variable called is expired. This is the wrong thing to do. If excuse me, token dot expires, uh, oh, whoops, it should be less than I got. Uh, I will edit this and and replace this. this is just a typo. But if um, if the token dot expires is less than the current date, then it's expired, obviously. Again, ignore the slide for now that it's that it's wrong. Well, Wait, but what happened right? I think it is right. Token expires is it's greater right. than now. Well, that's wouldn't it expires in the future. Oh, yeah, okay. I put it in the okay. future. So it is it is actually less than I just okay. I I had the two of these slides, I mixed them up because I was typing them at the same time the next one. But anyway, so you might think, if we put the less than sign in the, the right place, you might think, oh, AJ, what's wrong with this? Anybody know why this is dangerous and why this is going to lead to a huge security vulnerability in your code? I'm assuming it has to do with, are you sure what token expires is? 
Yeah, because what if Token Dots expires as bananas? Is bananas greater than Banana, or less bananas than? Do, or bananas do expire. But, but it'll, is, always be greater, but less, it'll always be less than. Because it's shorter. <laughs> yeah, so, well, we don't know. But that, so what you get back is you'll get back, um, you'll get back false because what will happen is token dot expires will turn into NAN. And then NAN compared against anything will always be false no matter what it is. And so then is expired will always be false. So what we can do instead is we can twist it around and we can say, well, is it fresh? Because if we consider is it fresh, then the unexpected value, the undefined, the null, the nan, all the values that we don't like, then they become useful. Because if token.expires is bananas somehow, then bananas less than now is going to be false, and so fresh will be false. Does this make sense? Any questions on that? So this is the principle of making the, the zero or the default value useful. Go calls it the zero value, what the default value is, because it's the empty string, zero, nil, a couple of other things like that. Anyway, so number six, empty interface says nothing to do. I forgot. <laughs> I thought, I thought, I was thinking. Okay, so. Well, so, that also says nothing, right? Oh, yeah. when you haven't done that slide. So I, I didn't mean to do this one because I was thinking about this one, but I must have, I, I hope, there's probably a few of them I accidentally skipped over in my haste. But interface, empty interface means that it doesn't give any type information. This is similar to the previous one about uh, the, the bigger the interface, the weaker the abstraction. If the interface is too small, or particularly when the interface has no definition whatsoever, you, you literally are not saying anything. And so to my, to what, what comes to my mind with this is Lodash. When you, have, when you have generics, when you have functions that are meant to work for anything and everything without any constraints, and you end up with functions that you have to go read the documentation on how they work because they're intended to be so generic that it's not clear from the function name what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, and there are some cases where an, an empty interface makes some sort of sense. So for example, with our early, our earlier example of a, of a get and a set. Now I called, I called the set key and text. So that tells us that text should be a string. But I might have just called it key and value. And in that case, conceptually, value has no information about it. It doesn't tell you what it is. And this is okay. It's okay that for a getter and a setter for a database, we say, well, maybe it's a number, maybe it's a string, maybe it's some JSON, maybe it's a Boolean. The database handler mechanism will figure out what it is and make sure it gets in the right format, comes back in the right format or throws an error, right? So in some cases, um, it's all right. It would be nice if we could have a getter and a setter for strings and a getter and a setter for numbers and a getter and a setter for bools. And so if I was going to set bool, I, you know, I could call set bool. That, that actually might be a little less conventional, especially for JavaScript, but it might be a little nicer in terms of readability. If I saw set bool, I'd go, oh, yeah, this, is, this has got all the logic in place. I know that it's going to give me a, a, a true or a false back. I know that I'm going to put a true or a false in. I know anything else is going to be an error. I can't accidentally set, set a string to this function. But that's the idea of the, the empty interface. Is it's, it's about both what type protection something provides as well as what you can tell from reading the function name. So I'll have to update that with some examples. All right. Ah, this is a go to. Go, GoFunct style is no one's favorite, yet GoFunct is everyone's style. GoFunct stands for format. Go format. You'll notice that all of the modern languages have a funct command. Rust, or is it CargoFunct or RustFunct? I don't know. But uh, then you've got, I think it's CargoFunct and then GoFunct. And then in JavaScript, we don't have GoFunct, but we have Prettier. <laughs> and Prettier style is no one's favorite, yet Prettier ought to be everyone's favorite. There is some strange resistance to prettier for some people. I but just disabled it because it was annoying. Yeah, you need to get over and that. I literally mean I did that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, you need to go over that. So this is this is what you should have in all of your package.json's is you should have a fumped script 
and then you put in this exact line right here and then you can npm run thumped and you can have this as a hook for uh, husky or whatever it is for the git commits and the idea is there's no need to bike shed about how things are formatted it's it's just a complete waste of time and even if artistically you'd like it if you know this this one line was a little longer or if there is some spacing here or whatever it just just use a formatter and forget about it and accept that yeah sometimes you might be able to make an artistic choice but the point of your code is not to let your inner picasso shine through the point of your code is to make it easy for other people to read and write and work with you. And so prettier is the thing that we have for that in JavaScript um, and you should use it. And if you wanna know why you should use it, there is the prettier rationale, which I also have on the Creeds of Craftsmanship, but this is the direct link. And it just explains why prettier makes the choices that it does. I'll bring out one little snippet here. If this is uh, in here, it might have actually been in a different section. But there was, there was one, ah, print width. I just thought this section was so, so great. So I'm gonna talk about that real quick. Uh, can you get rid of, can you go away? Thank you. All right. Uh, print width uh, option is more of a guideline to prettier than a hard rule. Uh, it, is, it is not the upper allowed line length limit. It is an easy way uh, for Prettier to say roughly how long you'd like your lines to be. So the print width in Prettier is not, it's going to be exactly 80 characters or exactly, you know, whatever. But, um, let's see. Oh, no, where, where was that? Oh, that, so what I was looking for wasn't here. Let me see if I can find, is that 120? No, it's not. Okay, I will just tell you, it may not be here in the rationale, it might have been in another document or an issue or something, I thought it was here in the rationale. But a lot of people think, oh, I have a widescreen monitor, therefore, I should make my code wider. Because my monitor is wide, therefore my code should be wide. But this is not how we as humans have evolved. The reasons that our eyes are wide set is to get very limited information, only motion information, out of the very corners of our eyes, right? This is to alert us if there is danger coming up beside us, right? You cannot read over here. This, this, you, cannot, you cannot read on the side. You can only see. Your area of focus is extremely narrow. Your area of focus typically goes about like what a letter is. It goes from top to bottom. So even though our visual acuity being based on movement, much like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, <laughs> uh, you know, we have these, the, this very wide field of vision. We don't use that for our concentration or our focus. And so it's, it's an error to think that because we have a wide monitor, our code should therefore be wide. Our, we read better. You'll learn this in any communications class. No one is going to argue against this. When you create a PowerPoint slide, you go bop, 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 bop. We read from top to bottom, and, uh, and it is easier to read from top to bottom than it is from left to right, and certainly than from right to top, because there are lots of... So I think you wanted to click that print width link in, inside the prettier thing. Click that. Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so this, uh, I just said this, but in not as smart and succinct of a way. I'm not going to reread it now. Okay, uh, Will, do we have any comments or questions online? Okay. A little copying is better than a little dependency. <laughs> this, this is one of my Bible verses. How could this apply to JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Dependency is king. Dependency is king. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's let's just uh, bring this up for reference real quick. It's just because all JavaScript developers are just codependent on everything. Well, it's Stack Overflow driven development. Um, let's see. Let's uh, where's the npm? There's have you seen this meme of the npm gravity well? Mm -hmm. It has uh, Earth. The sun, quasar, black hole, NPM. Let's let's or see node, if it node modules. 
Oh, yeah, my nerd modules folder. There we go. That's that's what we're looking for. I'll have to add this into the slides. <laughs> Create a wormhole there. Okay. So, a primary example being left bad, right? This is something that is so simple. Amazon just went down. Was it last month because of some dependency that was actually sabotaged by a developer who, so it's actually common for people in their 20s to develop mental illnesses that they didn't have before their 20s because that's when really? the brain finishes <laughs> developing. Yeah, so depression, schizophrenia, lots of those things hit uh, around 23 or so. So anyway, some dude sabotaged his own packages. I think if you follow the chain of events that he's had over the last couple of years, I think it's one of those types of things. Um, and it took down uh, the, all the AWS tools for a day or whatever because they had a dependency on some stupid little thing to print out a green color to the screen. Well, it's, it's dumb because people use libraries for trivial things right. like that you wouldn't know if you took a CS, like a CS course, right? Or if, if you just copy the color green. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, like, there was one that was like, what, left padding or something? Well, then, and that was a whole fiasco. I see that you have not been following. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> I've been, I've been watch, watching the comments and maybe coding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other the other example would be Lodash. What kind of coding? Are you trying to memory leak node? It's, it's a C program. Oh. <laughs> it's a secret program. So then, then we've got Lodash. Lodash is just lots of junk, most of which is native in JavaScript and completely unnecessary. So, but it wasn't always. Uh, but for the time that anybody here at the table has been a Node developer, it hasn't been. Yeah. It's been, you know, what, eight years? Anyway, so here's an example. I mean, I, I think rather than investing so much time in learning 100 functions in Lodash, you could invest time in learning the five or six functions that you need that are in JavaScript. Because all Lodash does is allows you to chain methods that already exist together. And it's, it's just easier to read and easier to understand what you're intending to do if you just chain those methods together a lot of the time. So, uh, but this, this is the typical type of thing that uh, you know, a left pad saves you from. You know, left pad, this is underscore dot for each. Does it really save you that much? Is it, is it worth using that all the time? I mean, this is the kind of thing where you should just be able to hit tab and this will autocomplete for you, right? <laughs> so, and, and then you don't have, it, it's just, there are so many things out there that if you can just copy the line that you need and if, if and many of these things are so generic that you don't even need to put a copyright thing on them because they're the only way to do it, right? I could, I could not copyright this, <laughs> right? So you don't even have to worry about licensing restrictions with most of this stuff. But if you go look at Lodash, that you just have a, one thing calls another thing calls another thing and everything depends on Lodash dependencies and you, you go to find where something's working and it's just, it's, it's easier to understand things when they're small, simple things that you just copy. And then sometimes you maybe have an utils.js folder. I generally recommend that you don't do that, but sometimes it's appropriate for just, you know, I have a few little things um, that you've copied over that you need. And, and then you don't have to worry about weird supply chain attacks or long download times, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, there are so many times, and it's not, it's not just this. What really gets me is when you, you need one function from one library. Say you want to be able to parse a command line arguments. So you know, basically it's going to split on white space or something. And you grab that function, but what comes with it is Babel and TypeScript and um, colors package and then, the, 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 then uh, a whole set of a suite of, of uh, executable tools and and then there's some sort of install script. And so you, you really needed three lines of code. And it's not just that you have a dependency on something like Lodash, which at least is pretty self-contained. It's that you started depending on hundreds of megabytes of things, potentially. And that's where it, it, it's seriously dangerous and counterproductive. 
Okay, uh, moving on. Are any other questions, comments about that little copying of better little dependency? I'm going to get that tattoo one day. <laughs> well, that would kind of be a dependency, so maybe I'll write that on my wrist one day. Okay. Yes. Syscalls must always be guarded with build tags. Now, in JavaScript, we don't really have syscalls, so I, I'll just tell you what this means in Go because I don't know how to quite equate it. A syscall, well, you can. You could have C++. Um, I, what, I, what I would say with this is if you're going to do something in JavaScript that requires compiled C++ code or compiled Rust code, you should make sure that you have a JavaScript alternative as well because it's really annoying when you go to install something and then you need it for some old version of Node and then it wants you to install a C compiler just so that, because Go, Go, you can use C code from Go, you can use C code from Node, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just, it's just really annoying when you try to compile something and it fails because it's depending on C code and it needs you to go get GCC or C lang or install X. Well, you're good. if you're on Mac, you're going to install X code no matter what. You can't really avoid it. But um, yeah, in, in Go, you have, you in the same folder, you can have four different versions of the file. Actually, I know, I know what this relates to in, in JavaScript. I'll get to that in just a second. But in Go, you have four different versions of a file in the same folder, and one will be called my thing underscore Windows, my thing underscore Linux, my thing underscore FreeBSD, my thing underscore Mac OS, so on and so forth. And what it allows you to do is to be able to um, make sure that it's clear that something is or isn't implemented for a particular operating system, and when it goes to compile, it knows that either by a tag that you put in the file as a comment at the very top or by the name of the file itself, it knows which file to pick when it's doing its build process. And so Go is intended to be very cross-platform. It's intended to work everywhere. And as long as you don't do something stupid or something highly niche and specific, which it is likely that you will need to do from time to time, uh, Go will run on all platforms and compile it. All platforms. Now, this is what I would say. This is how this relates to JavaScript. Package.json has a browser field, and it is an object. I'm going to go ahead and just type this up as an example to show you how this works. Whoops. Uh, just uh, get out of .com. Can I? It's going to make me log in. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go to bliss.js.org. There we go. Now I can get a nice type pad here. Okay, so let's bring this bigger. So in your package.json, you can have a browser, and you can provide a mapping of any module to any other module. So let's say lib request.js, we're going to translate that to lib, or maybe browser request.js. So if for any module that you have, and maybe you have some hashing functions. You can abstract those away like this. So that when you go, when, when somebody that's using Node uses your code, they're going to get lib request.js. But if somebody uses Webpack to get your code, they'll get browser request.js. Now, in the case of a request, there are already packages such as fetch. Uh, in particular, fetch is actually being adopted as a Node standard, so we won't need this kind of thing. But hashing functions in in uh, web crypto are really terrible. The API was designed on purpose to be uh, difficult to work with and we actually have a JavaScript Jabber episode explaining um, explaining that there was somebody on the committee that tried really hard to fight for the users and the other people just kind of voted them off the island. And so, but anyway, so sometimes there's things that um, you, don't, you don't have to have code only work in Node. Isomorphism is not some mythical dream that can't happen. All you got to do is provide uh, a, a, you know, a fairly fairly shallow and weak abstraction, but one that's necessary for this use case. Um, and you can have your, your code work in both uh, Node and browser very easily. So that's, that's what I would actually relate that to. Okay, 
Uh, number 10, Seago must always be guarded with build tags. I'm going to go ahead and say these two are basically the same thing because uh, syscall, a syscall is when Go needs to talk to the operating system kernel. I don't know if I actually finished that sentence earlier. Seago is when Go needs to call out to a C library. And these two are essentially the same thing if we were to translate them to JavaScript. It's, it's just find a way to make sure that you, you either tag, tag things as Node or Browser if you want to make your code more portable. And then you know, if you have to, you can throw an exception um, so that the Webpack build will still build. But then if the person doesn't use that function, it doesn't break the program. Okay, so that one we don't have. Now, this one I think is really important. Seago is not Go. Let's translate that. JSX is not JS, and it's not. It really isn't. It's actually a different language. It has different syntax. Uh, it, JSX, you may notice, does not support JavaScript features. It supports different features. So anytime you have a super subset of a language, that's just... BS. That's a completely different language. There's no such thing as a super subset. Because if you, have, if you have a different set of features, you don't support the features of the main language, and you support other features that the main language doesn't support, you literally do not have that language. And that's what JSX is. JSX does not support modern JavaScript. You have to run it through Babel. And, and, and you know, you'll get your linter warnings about things that, if you check browser support on um, can I use dot, was it can I use dot net, can I use dot com, whatever it is. I forget the, the, mm -hmm. what the extension of the site is. Something like that. So can I use will tell you what's actually, can I use dot com. So can I use will tell you what's actually available in a browser. So for example, is await available in browsers. And what I can see is, yes, it's available in Every browser except for the Wii U. Um, what about IEV? The $20 feature phones, that's <laughs> no longer supported by anything. And then KaiOS is certain TVs and some phones in India. And I think QQ and, and Baidu, yeah, they're, they're defunct. No, Baidu is defunct. QQ, I'm not sure if that one's still going or not. But, uh, I mean, these could be important if you are in uh, the Asian market where you're servicing China and India and you know that you've got people that are on feature phones in China with the QQ browser or the feature phones in India with the KaiOS, which used to be Firefox OS. Um, I don't even think feature phones in the United States are, I think we're so far past, yeah, UC Browser for Android, originally called Android Browser. You used to have to install Chrome on your Android phone. Long gone, right? So uh, this is, you, know, you can go and you can see, can I use this feature? Well, if there's a feature that's been around in browsers for two years and JSX still doesn't support it, that's, that's because it's a different language. It's literally not JavaScript. Um, and then ECMAScript is not JavaScript. This one's a little bit harder to sell, but JavaScript, was the language that was invented by Brendan Eich and uh, all the way up until about ECMAScript 5, it was the same language. ECMAScript 6 plus, they literally broke the syntax of the language. It became a different language. It's no longer the same. Now, um, I think there's a lot of stuff in ECMAScript that's worth using, but ECMAScript really isn't JavaScript. Um, and I think most of the things in ECMAScript that are different from JavaScript are not worth using, but there are a few things like async await. Now that they're supported across browsers and across platforms almost universally, I think that um, you know, it's, it, it can lead to, to cleaner, better code. Uh, and of course, Babel is not ECMAScript. So this, again, is the super subset problem. If you take some hypothetical specification, and this, this is really, really, really bad for your code. If you take a hypothetical specification that may never land in a browser, and then you build your program on top of it, you can never get rid of Babel. This is the JSX problem. JSX depends on Babel. It was implemented with certain features that never evolved in JavaScript and other features that did evolve in JavaScript that didn't get adopted by Babel because it'd be too expensive to go back and rewrite Babel to use modern JavaScript. And so now we have all these mismatch of targets where 
if you want to get a weight in JavaScript through Babel, it has to transpile it to promises, then transpile it. No, it has to transpile it to generators, then transpile it to promises. Or it's just if you look at what the chain of events has to be for certain features that are natively supported in browsers to go through Babel, it's it's insane because there's this mismatch of support. So uh, I would say just stick to the stuff on Can I Use where it's pretty much been out in most browsers for the last couple of years. So here we can see 2017, you know, it's been five years since 2017. It's been six years since 2016. It's been six years since 2016. You know, when you look across the board here and you see when, when did browsers start supporting this? When you're looking at browsers started supporting it five years ago and all mainstream browsers support it, you should be able to use that feature no problem. But if it's been six months and only Chrome implements it, it's not worth it. Don't use it. Don't especially because sometimes Chrome is doing the Babel thing where it's implementing features ahead of schedule that haven't actually been standardized. They've only been proposed. They're, they're trying something out. And it, I just don't think it's, it's worth it to have useless conveniences when you're making your build process more complicated, you're making what people have to learn more complicated, uh, you're taking a gamble on something that by the time that it reaches standardization might not even be cool anymore. So think about classes in JavaScript. They were all the hot mess and then it was like, wait a minute, this is a terrible idea. JavaScript relies entirely on asynchronous state. That makes no sense for classes and inheritance. Uh, generators, you know, oh, generators, really cool. Wait a minute, this is just super complicated and it isn't actually a use case that we have in Node or the browser, right? So, yeah, I think that's really important. With the unsafe package, there are no guarantees. I don't know, maybe, maybe that I should call that one Babel. I don't know how to relate this. But in Go, there's a concept of safe and unsafe. So in JavaScript, we don't get true unsafe. I, I guess we could say with... Strict and unsafe. Well, yeah, that one, that could work. That's, that's actually a really good one. But yeah, I'll, I'll riff off of that as well as node modules that are C++ modules. So if you run your code not in strict mode, there are numerous errors that will pass silently rather than being brought to the fore. Strict mode disables certain bugs in JavaScript that couldn't be, that weren't very, weren't very widely used and can easily be uh, avoided. Usually we don't need to depend on the behavior of bugs. But in a couple of cases in JavaScript, obviously people, if something's there, people find a way to use it, right? And so strict mode uh, surfaces some bugs and your linter is probably already set to use strict mode. It's just good to put it in there. But if you take, if you take JavaScript out of strict mode, it, there's just stupid errors you can get. For example, you can declare uh, a variable i in two different files and have them cross talk. I think you can still do that anyway, actually. Or you can have something undeclared. Oh, this is where the problem is. You declare a variable i in one location in a higher scope and you don't declare it somewhere else that is still within that scope, but maybe in a different file. And when they get packaged together, again, this is browser, not, not node, but when they get packaged together, the uh, one function would, could be using the, the I that's in the global scope or something like that. So it's just a couple of weird things like that that can happen if you're not using um, uh, strict mode. Also, I will say, if you are using, if you're using WASM, or you're using C++ modules in Node, the garbage collector may not work. So you have to be careful to read the notes on any module that uses WASM or C++ modules because a lot of times it will tell you that when you're done with something you have to call free or clear or delete or unset. Uh, because if you don't, then every time you create that object it'll allocate memory in WASM or in C++ and then the JavaScript garbage collector can't touch that memory because it lives elsewhere. So you just have a bridge between the two. So that's something that I are think. There, are there any popular projects like that right now where you could accidentally do that? Like if you do have the bigger than a black hole NPM module uh, I, I don't think I don't think ones that you'd get from the black hole. Okay. No, but there is one called Relic mm -hmm. that is a cryptographic library that is used by 
pretty much anything that is Web3 or blockchain related. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one, if I recall correctly, at least certain implementations of it, if not the most popular implementations of it, require that you free the memory uh, manually after you do the, the signing or hashing function. That's good to know. So if you're doing Web3, keep an eye out for that stuff. Yeah, I mean, you're, you'd probably be using something that's built on top of it, mm -hmm. not using it directly. But yeah, if you did go with that, there, there are things out there occasionally. Basically, if, it, if it's built with WASM, if you see in the description that it's built with WASM, and you have some weird, strange memory leak, and it doesn't show up in the JavaScript call stack, it's probably that type of scenario. And same thing in Node. But in Node, we ver Node is so performant that we very rarely ever need to use C++ code for day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, we typically need to use the C++ code when we're interacting with the operating system, uh, such as FS Watch or or C code like Relic that is not available anywhere else because it hasn't been implemented. Okay, number 13, clear is better than clever. This one's really simple. We've already talked about this several times, so I'll just show this again. This is clear. Default value of foo is going to be bar. If bar has baz, then foo is going to be baz. This is clever. You know, and these are simple examples, but here on this side, you can get more and more and more complicated. There's actually a Twitter, um, there's, there's a tweet. Somebody asked me, is this an appropriate use of const? And they had some sort of function, or no, they asked me if it was appropriate use of let. And they had some sort of function that was basically trying to do, uh, whoops, I think it was, I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was trying to do. It's something maybe like this. But anyway, when you reduce down the logic of what he was trying to do, it ended up being, uh, it ended up reducing down to something that was this simple or maybe even simpler. I don't know how you get simpler than that, but. Um, so clear is better than clever. Reflection is never clear. We don't have, ref, reflection is not a word we use in JavaScript. So let me say metaprogramming instead. So JavaScript has introduced ways to do metaprogramming, uh, things like weak set, uh, a weak map, um, things like, well, I'll get uh, the proxies fall into that. Yeah, so yeah. So you've never heard so of any of that. Hmm? You've never heard of any of that. Good, good. Well, I'm going to show you one. So here we have thing dot count plus equals one. So let's say we create a new object and it doesn't have count. What will this do? Set it to one. No. Set it to two. No, it doesn't have it doesn't have a count. Explode. It's an empty object. Oh, die. No, nope. it'll give you nan. It'll just give you nan over and over and over again. Not a number. Not a number. Not a number. So how can we solve this? Well, we could use object.define property, of course. So we could take our thing object and we could define count on it with a getter that returns a thing. Actually, writable would have to be true here, not false. Another typo in the slides. Uh, so and then. If thing doesn't exist, then we can return zero, right? Why or don't we just use dot prototype. Did the same thing. <laughs> no. Or we can just set count is equal to zero when we create the object. Is that, but I, I literally came across this code last week. I, I came across this exact problem last week. At work. Uh, no, not at not at Savvy, but uh, with with the dash voting, the the. Well, I'll, I'll remove that from the repo before we get to work tomorrow. <laughs> okay, good. But yeah, the, typically the there there are times when we want to use metaprogramming, particularly if you're if you're developing a framework. So, for example, React might be at such a scale with the number of DOM elements that it's manipulating, where something like a weak set would make sense, but. You probably should never use it, and if you do use it, it should be judiciously with, with disgust, not because it's cool. Weak set is less performant than using a plain old object is until you hit something. I don't remember where it is, but there's, there's certain things where when you get into the 10,000 to 100,000 range, stuff starts to get different, and, and you start to need to do ugly things in order to you know, get performance, but again, you know, typically you're not doing those things. Anyway. Um, 15, mm -hmm. errors or values. We're coming up towards the end here, folks. Just FYI. It's not going to go on forever, I think. Errors or values. This one, uh, I can summarize basically like this. 
you should almost never do a try catch. Uh, try catch is treating an error as an exceptional thing, and it th this is one of those cases where you have to read from right to top to figure out what's going on because you'll have some try block and you'll have some stuff here, and you have a catch block down at the bottom. And in order to figure out, you have to kind of bounce back and forth to figure out what was set where, and it's really confusing because some stuff in the try block will execute, but other stuff in the try block might not execute. And then when you get to the catch, you, you don't actually know what state the program is in. Um, so just in general, try catch is a code smell. Uh, you shouldn't treat errors as, uh, except for truly exceptional errors that are actually exceptions. So for example, JSON dot parse, you have to wrap in a try catch block. You have no other option. But pretty much unless you're parsing, you should never use try catch. Yes, sir. So why should you not? So let's say that wait wasn't there. Why is this also wrong? Um, or actually, I, so, so what I should say is, why should we not use try catch? Uh, what should we use instead? Okay, so. All right, I see you're good. So what you can do with anything that's asynchronous is you really literally get a value. Errors in JavaScript are values. Errors, generally speaking, should not be exceptions. Oh, and I'm missing the await here. So await do stuff dot catch. So don't, don't try await, await catch instead. And then you can either handle or rethrow that value. And uh, we'll talk about what that means in just a second. So don't just check errors, handle them gracefully. Hmm? I was just, she was just saying that's what she does by default. And I've never done that before. This one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the right way to do it. Good job. <laughs> So uh, don't just check handle errors, handle them gracefully. So this is what checking an error looks like. And again, I should have put the await there. Uh, is okay. Well, there's an error, and then I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end things right here. Well, especially for oh, I should have done next error or something. Yeah, anyway, um, the, the, so this is not this is not bad, but it's not it's not great. This might be the right thing in certain situations, but let's care, compare it to oh, whoops that. Went on two slides. Um, yeah, so here's handling gracefully. So let's say that we have a DB package and the DB package has, uh, I should also fix this slide, so error, error no record. So we could check to see if we have an error no record, we could just return an empty object, right? Because if there is no record, we can recover from that gracefully. If, if uh, you know, we're, we're looking to see, oh, the user's trying to sign in with this username and, and uh, well, this would actually be the opposite case of duplicate, uh, duplicate record. But any, anyway, there's, there's cases where if you get an error from the database, you can handle that error in a graceful way. You can say, oh, there's no, you know, you wanted to add a bookmark, but you don't have any bookmarks yet. Okay, we can create your bookmarks list. You know, you want to add a friend, but you don't have a friend list yet. We can create your friend list. Oh, you're going to say you don't have friends. <laughs> <laughs> you want to create a friends list, but you don't have friends. Your friends list. I'll be your friend. But then there's there's the opposite. So say a user is going to log in. Uh, or you're going to create a user, but they use the same username and password. They already have an account and they use the same username and password because a lot of times it's confusing between the login and the sign up and the, you know, presents you one first and all that. So if you just, if you just handle it gracefully, whether they click the login with Facebook button or whether they sign or they click, you know, have a username and password, just check and see, Hey, does this user exist? If it exists and they're logging in with Facebook, even though they're on the sign up page, just sign them in, right? We've all had this problem. Same thing, you know, username, password. Oh, the user already exists. Don't return the duplicate record error. Instead, say, oh, the user already exists. Let's check and see if the password that they just put in the form matches what they have. Oh, look, log them in, right? <laughs> that's what they wanted. So that's, that's what this, this uh, is all about. Don't just check errors, handle them gracefully. I'll leave that on there for a second again. Okay, so. Design the architecture, name the components, document the details. Just do it. <laughs> uh, so this one is just an overarching principle. When you... 
write a program, <laughs> design it, uh, architecturally. <laughs> I don't know, I just feel like this one's just self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have much else to say, so I, I, I guess I won't until maybe in the future I come up with some better example for this. But yeah, take, take the time to consider what you want your design to be. Take the time to name things appropriately. Don't just call it stuff. And if you called it person, but it starts, or if you called it, uh, let's say account, this is a problem we had at work. If you called it account, but then it turns out you actually need an organization as one thing and an individual as another thing, then you know, rename it, split the things out. And then document the details, uh, whether in comments, which in Go, the documentation is generated from the comments. JS doc is good. Uh, but it's not as universally adopted in JavaScript. We don't have as nice of a system for this, but JS doc can use for this where you just put the comments and where there's little nuanced details, just make sure they make it in there. You know, um, this must start from this, this number can't be lower than two. It can be any inter integer, but it must be greater than two. You know, things that you wouldn't be able to tell from the code itself, uh, those little details, document them. And then we have documentation is for users, and of course, developers are our users, other developers. So consider that the documentation is for a human on the other end. I don't think we really in this room have this problem too much because I don't think any of us are working jobs that are too enterprisey. But sometimes in the enterprisey situations, which is what I think this was to combat against, um, I mean, if you've ever read AWS documentation, that's the counterexample of this. Right? I think bad Java docs are a good example too. Uh, often they'll, you know, the comments won't actually be useful. They'll, they'll put some weird implementation detail, and it's mostly just a list of methods. Oh. It feels like it's, it's made for other developers who keep, who come, who are like working on that code, not ones who are using it. Yeah. Ah, good distinction. Thanks for that. Okay, and then lastly, oh wait, what is this icon here? This is the Apple icon for, Apple always has these little Easter eggs. I've never noticed this one. Can anybody read that? No. Oh, here's, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes. Do not go gently. I recognize that quote, but it's Steve Jobs. Yeah. It's it's his yeah. his greatest speech from the the Think Different campaign. Mm. Here's to the misfits. I like that thing. Throw hammers through walls. Oh, apparently he stole it from somebody else. I too. was going to say I thought it was someone oh. else, but that is very characteristic. Though. Well, I <laughs> like <laughs> he also recorded the uh, you know, great artist steel or something. Uh, yeah, uh, good artist Well, great so artist steel. but this this is the crazy thing about that. That was a Trumpism, because Steve Jobs made that up and attributed it to someone greater than himself, right? So that's that's the two sides of the coin. The one thing is the the good artist copy, great artist steal, you take somebody else's work and you reform it to make it yours. You remix it in a way that is better and more vertically integrated. The other thing is when you don't have anyone to back you, you just make someone up. You know, you, you, you uh, well, we call it name dropping, right? Yeah. So you make yourself sound better by referencing, you know, if, if, you, if I have a good idea, I don't tell you what my good idea is. So all these ideas about JavaScript that I'm trying to indoctrinate you with. I didn't come out and say, hey, these are AJ's ideas about JavaScript. I said, hey, here's Rob Pike, one of the greatest thinkers in the industry, and I'm going to adapt his words and, I think and make it's JavaScript. Social pre programming. Yeah. I heard about it at uh, the hacker convention in Vegas. Why am I? DEF CON. There you go. And it was when Obama was running for office, and he said, Obama's really good at this. He always makes someone up that tells you how great Obama is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of them. I think Trump did it to excess. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Trump did it. They always tell me. They always tell me they love me. I just, I can't. Every time they're talking, all I hear is they love me. They love me. Everyone's telling me how yeah. great I am. Yeah. There was so many. I didn't even say come it. up with a name. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyway, so number 19 is Don't Panic. And this is, of course, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. And this table reference. Uh, yep. Yeah, and, yeah. and what this is uh, in reference to Go, and likewise in reference to JavaScript, because they're very similar in their error handling, is so, so Go has a concept of Go treats exceptions differently from errors. Go actually has errors can be thrown as exceptions, but generally errors are returned as values. And that's what we were talking about with the dot catch is then you get it as a value. It's scoped properly. You don't have to go read here and there to figure out what happened. You know what happened because you've got a line item in your code. And if the dot catch executed, you know that one line failed. You don't have to guess about you know what, how many dozens of things. But uh, so don't panic is basically don't throw, just don't, don't do try catches, don't throw exceptions. And in the case of Go, there, there is, I'll give the counter example of this, there are places where, because JavaScript and Go are memory safe languages, there are places where uh, perhaps for performance or for convenience, you might want to let errors bubble up. Uh, or exceptions bubble up. So generally, we'd want to say, check, is this, you know, does this have a value? Does thing.foo, does it have a value? And if it does, then we're going to call thing.foo. Do some stuff. I should have put this on the slide with a better example. But in those types of situations, um, sometimes you just want to really assume the happy path. Assume that the data that you were given is properly formatted. You don't want to do all those checks. And so the counter example to this is, I think, a better descriptor because this is the rule but the exception is. Sometimes you just want to have a whole bunch of logic and just wrap, don't, don't do the normal checks and everything. Just assume the happy path, let the whole logic do what it does, and then only at the top level where you call into that logic then you have your try catch block, uh, and you basically transform that error into you know didn't parse correctly or something like that. Rather, than, and it depends on the level of detail that you want because you will you obviously you lose detail if you do it that way. Because if you if you are able to handle it you know, down at the spot where it occurs, then you can potentially get better, more valuable information. But uh, that that's kind of the counter example is the rare few exceptions generally where you're parsing something or you're traversing an object very deeply, you might want to just say, I assume this is the happy path, encapsulate that whole thing, and then just have the, the try-catch around at the top. But other than that, don't, don't try-catch. Either handle errors gracefully or, um, or pass, them, pass them up as a value in a way that you can receive them and do something useful with them. So, yeah. And uh, so those, those are... The Go Proverbs adapted to JavaScript. Woo. So, any other questions, comments, thoughts? You were mentioning Babel and JSX. I haven't heard of that in a long time. What, what was the? What was that even for? I mean, is it uh, anybody that uses React doesn't. People that program, people that use React don't program in JavaScript. React and JavaScript, React is kind of incompatible with JavaScript. Right. So if you create a React module, it doesn't work the same way as a JavaScript module and a bunch of other stuff like that. So that, that's, it is extremely relevant. Uh, React encourages you not to write normal JavaScript. Because um, it, because it, well, not just because it's a framework, I think that it's actually an intentional design choice is they want you, the guy who created React essentially said the problem with React is JavaScript. And then he created another transpiler called Reason, mm -hmm. which uh -huh. it, I don't think it really gained much traction. But anyway, there's, there's just a lot of stuff out there. There was CoffeeScript, there's JSX, there's all these languages that are supposed to transpile down to JavaScript, but then you're investing in some temporary technology that's not gonna be around for that long in the grand scheme of things and that is hiding away from you how to learn the things that are the most useful. If you, 90% of quote unquote React could be written in JavaScript. Well, let's say 50% because 50% of React is an abuse of HTML. But 
But if you, if you were to take all the functions that you write in React, if you were to write them in JavaScript instead and just use them as libraries, so that you, you, know, you, you have a, a folder where you have code and it's just plain JavaScript code. There's no funny business in it, no, no weird module syntax, no weird HTML syntax. You just program standard JavaScript and that's all you did. You could use that from React without a problem. If, if it's published as a separate module on, on NPM or you have a, a way to, if, if you put it in the React project, then React wants you to do it the React way. And, and so if you, try to, if you try to just use a normal JavaScript file from within a React project, it, it gets funky. But if you, if you publish it to NPM and then you use it as a library, or you publish it to GitHub and then just use a, a Git URL to add it, and you can put in the same you know, secret so that you can have private repository access or private submodules or whatever, but uh, if you do that, then, then you can use normal JavaScript and React, and that's more valuable because then you're investing in a skill that's long term and that is standardized and that you know, generally works pretty darn well, rather than um, you know, having all of these weird you know, React abstractions intermingled with your code, right? So if you, if you wanted to sort, um, if you wanted to sort a bunch of elements, for example, you can write that in JavaScript. You don't, you don't have to write that in React. Mm -hmm. And you can pass in a, you know, an array into some function that you wrote in JavaScript, and you, know, you could use that function from, from React, and it would, it would work. Uh, and then, then you have reusable JavaScript that's just plain JavaScript. Did I say that a million times enough? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. I feel like most of the time when people say JSX, they were referring to just a HTML-like syntax that we write React in, so, right? It, it makes me perk my mouth a little bit, the combination of HTML syntax and JavaScript syntax. Mm -hmm. I, I, it doesn't visually, yeah. I don't know, but I'm not a React person, so. Yeah. yeah. Feels real ugly to me. Yeah. Uh, well, second, then second you would mm -hmm. even be more confusing. Because I write in React and Vue, uh, and I haven't wrote Vue in two months, and it was like I was writing it the other day. I was like, "This hurt my brain." <laughs> I want React now. Well, uh, I, but again, if you just write your, if you write the majority of your stuff in JavaScript, if you write your requests, you write uh, any of your utility functions. If you just write those in JavaScript, then I, you might actually be doing more what the people that originally created React in some ways and intended in terms of, because you're not writing reusable composable code if you're intermixing HTML with logic all the time. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, React syntax is so weird that it seems that sometimes if you want to abstract the, the JavaScript from the HTML, you end up having to write single line components and I don't know, that's, that's a whole different discussion. It just yeah, it gets too on messy. The, on the React docs, it says JSX is a syntax extension to JavaScript. Rec we recommend using it with React to describe what the UI should look like. So you don't even have to use it. They just recommend that you do, and everyone does. That's uh, funny. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to use it. Uh, yes and no. Yeah. Anyway, anything else? Not me. Are you accepted cons into your life? <laughs> <laughs> Only for Pi. Uh, Only for Pi. Is there something that needs to be moderated on your Twitch channel? I don't know. Uh, I asked because Will asked me if I had moderator privileges. I'm like, I don't think so. Oh, there's a whole bunch of people that have been uh, uh, making comments. Oh. Let's get rid of the uh, block, block list. Hey, sorry everybody. I because I just moved. I didn't have my setup, and so I didn't have a second monitor. Um, so I have not been checking the comments. I'd be really interested in knowing what the Mr. Robot thing was about. And someone thinks you're at work. And what? Are you at work? Oh no, it's probably because the background. Because they can see they've been seeing me the whole time. Yes. I've been and do it whatever.
All right, anyway, thanks for joining out online. Like if you like it, thumbs up if you got it, thumbs down if you don't, and uh, we'll catch you all next time for another exciting episode of Utah JS. Look forward to it. Utah no JS. Oh, and thanks, thanks again to Vivint for making this all possible, and Jeff. Yay, hey, Jeff. To do a better job of plugging Vivint. Okay, and then next time we'll be back with our normal setup when I, because I'll be done moving and I'll have all my stuff with me and, yeah. All right, adios. Thank you. Bye. See you next month.